Hello and welcome to the John F. Wood Center. My name is Justin, and in this tutorial series, I will be taking you through various pieces of equipment in the makerspace and showing you how they work. This video will be explaining how the cameras work. Cameras can be difficult to understand at times since the process of capturing photos and videos is much more complicated and manual compared to using a camera on a cell phone. In this tutorial, I will be giving a basic rundown for beginners on how to operate a camera and the common settings you might need to know before taking photos and video. In the makerspace, we currently offer three cameras that are available for loaning. Our Lumix camera, more specifically the Lumix DMC FC300, our Sony camera, the Sony A330, and our Canon camera, the Canon EOS Rebel SL3. Since these cameras are all completely different models made by different companies, the menus, buttons, and functions will have noticeable differences. For the purposes of this tutorial, I will use the Canon camera to explain the fundamentals of operating each camera in general and then highlight the differences you may run into between different models of cameras. I would also recommend the Canon camera for beginners since the menus have tutorials and guides that are useful for learning the basics. We will start by examining the core physical components of the camera. Then then we will walk through the process of how to take a simple photo and change some basic settings, and then we will end off on an explanation on how to take photos in manual mode. Let's begin with examining the core physical components. In the bottom of each camera, you will find the battery compartment. It is very important to ensure that your battery is charged before you begin using the camera, which you can check when turning the camera on. In each camera bag, there is a charger that plugs into the wall, and you can simply snap the battery into the charger. In the battery component, you might also find the slot for the SD card. Other cameras will have this slot to the side, but the Canon camera has it with the battery. SD cards are important since all the photos and videos that you take will be saved there, and this is how you will bring your photos from the camera to the computer. In the makerspace, our Canon camera comes with its own SD card, but the Lumix and Sony cameras do not. We do offer other SD cards for loaning, but you will have to be mindful of this when choosing your camera that you may also need to pick out an SD card. One last thing to note before we turn on the camera is the lens cap. It is important to keep this on when you are not using the camera to protect the lens. Otherwise, you can take it off now so that we can begin shooting. Now, let's turn on the camera. Each camera's on switch should be on the top similar to the Canon demonstrated here. In the case of our camera in particular, the photo and video mode is separated here on the on switch rather than the mode dial or somewhere else on the camera. We'll begin on the photo mode and then delve into the video later. The easiest way to understand how a camera works is to first shoot in automatic while learning the rudimentary settings. The mode dial at the top is how you choose between the different types of camera modes, which we will get into later in the video. For now, you're going to want to choose the automatic setting, which should be the only colored option on each of the cameras. Now, let's take a look at all the buttons and features on the camera, including the viewfinder, the lens, the shutter release button, the physical display, the basic settings, the pop-up flash, and then ending off on the mode dial. The viewfinder is the top eyepiece part of the camera that you hold close to your eye, allowing you to see what is being photographed. While this is the standard way of being able to see what your photos will look like before you take them, it's harder to demonstrate for this tutorial, and it might not be as intuitive for beginners. For the purposes of this tutorial, we will use the Live View button, which should have a camera icon or LV next to the viewfinder, so that we can see what the picture will look like on our screen instead. There are separate use cases for either of these modes, but an important thing to note is that the photos will be closer to how they look on the live view since the screen will take into account shutter speed, aperture, and other settings that affect how the image will look, whereas the viewfinder mainly provides the framing of the photo. The lens is how you can affect the zoom and the focus of the photo. By twisting the middle of the lens, you can zoom in and out on the photo physically. The lens should be set to automatic focus, which is an ideal setting most of the time when you want to take simple photos. However, you can set the focus to manual and then twist the end of the lens to change where the focus of the picture is, either being closer or farther away. For most instances though, you'll likely want to set the focus to automatic. The shutter release button is on the end of the camera, and that's what you'll press to take the photo. You can do a half press to have the camera focus on your subject, and then a full press to take the photo. Compared to everything else on the list, the display changes the most between each camera. The Canon camera in particular has the most sophisticated display out of the three, as it includes touchscreen and twisting functionality, which is especially helpful in its live view. As a general overview, the display helps you to see the settings of the camera in both modes. In its live view, you can see some of the more basic settings and you can change them straight from the display on the Canon camera. 
I will go through some of the basic settings you can find on the display menu, but it's important to note that you may need to go into the actual menu on the other cameras to change these settings. The most important setting is how your images will be saved, and you will likely have the option between RAW and JPEG on each camera. Essentially, RAW files contain the unprocessed data from the camera's photos, meaning you will get a large file containing all of the information from the photo. JPEG files, on the other hand, involve some processing and compression to make the photo look more natural, remove redundant data, and compress the file to make it easier to use. There are benefits and cons to each file format. JPEGs are easier to use and take up less space, but RAW files will give you more quality and are ideal if you want to do color correction or other image touch-ups on the computer since more information is stored on the file. You have the option to save each photo you take as both a RAW and a JPEG file, which is what I would recommend. JPEGs are easier to work with for beginners, but it's always nice to have a RAW photo file you can go back to years down the line to touch up if you needed to. When you choose your file formats, you can see how many images you have the space for. You will also have the option to compress your RAW and JPEG files further, but it is not not recommended to do so. Another important setting is the drive mode, and here is where you'll find most of the basic shooting settings you may want to change. The default mode is single shooting, which is pretty self-explanatory. You hit the shutter button, and it takes a single photo. The other important shooting mode to know is continuous, where the camera keeps taking photos for as long as you hold down the shutter button. This can be helpful for shots where a subject is in action. There are also timers here if you have a tripod and would like to take photos, including yourself. The last important setting from this menu is the flash. You can choose to enable it for your shot, but you will also have to lift the pop-up flash on the top for the actual flash to be visible. Keep in mind that the flash only extends up to 10 feet. Afterwards, the lighting effect will not be noticeable. One last thing to note about the Canon camera's display in particular is that photos can be taken by tapping on the screen. The camera will also focus on the subject dependent on where you tap, so this could be a more intuitive method for getting the photo results that you like. Now, let's quickly talk about video as that is also a key component to each of these cameras. Depending on the camera, the method to switching the video will be different. But on the Canon camera, it uses the same on switch to go from the photo to video mode as I mentioned before. The screen will look different this time around, but the functions of the camera are very similar. The main difference is that the live view is a requirement for video, and to start recording, you must click on the button with the red circle, which in this case is the same button as switching the live view. If we take a look at the menus, there is one important setting to consider, that being movie recording size, which dictates the quality, frames per second, and the file size of your final video. The main options that I would recommend choosing are the 4K option, the Full HD Light option, and the Full HD 60fps option. 4K will give you the highest possible quality, but a big file size and a slower frame rate. Not noticeably slow, but if you want your footage to be smoother, then this likely isn't your best option. The 60fps option will give you a super smooth video with a lot of frames, which is good for things like action in slow motion, but it will not be as high quality as 4K, and the file size will be decently big still. The Full HD Lite option will give you a great looking video with the lowest data size. I would not recommend choosing the other options outside of these three as you may be sacrificing too much quality in your footage. Now let's give a brief overview of the mode dial, and we will switch back to photo mode for this part. The mode dial can be confusing and will look very different depending on the camera you're using, but the structure of the dial should be the same. There should be an automatic mode, a manual mode, some modes in between the two that mix elements from each, and some bonus modes that give you creative filters or take different types of shots. How you use the modes is completely up to you, as you can take some great photos with the automatic mode without needing to learn the manual settings. Though, if you wish to take up photography, then learning the three settings that make up a manual photo will be important. There is a concept called the exposure triangle that dictates how a photo is going to look. The three metrics to this triangle include shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. In automatic mode, the camera will adjust all of these metrics for you, but manual mode gives you complete freedom to choose the value for each metric. The nice thing about the Canon camera is that it has some guides to explain what each metric does, including an isolated mode on the mode dial to adjust the metrics separately and have the other metrics be chosen automatically. For example, the TV mode will allow you to adjust shutter speed separately and have the aperture and ISO be chosen automatically based on what you chose. For the purposes of this tutorial, I will briefly explain what each metric means and some basic numbers to consider when starting out, but I recommend doing more research into the exposure triangle concept if you are interested in manual photography. Shutter speed is the simplest concept. 
It determines the speed at which the shutter of the camera closes, meaning motion and the amount of light that will be let into the photo will be different. Fast shutter speeds are better for shots that need less motion blur, which only takes in a little bit of light, while slow shutter speeds are better for photos that require a longer exposure. It's recommended to keep the value below 1 over 60 or 80 as a minimum baseline. 1 over 125 is a good recommendation for portraits, and 1 over 320 to 400 is good for fast moving objects. Aperture is essentially the pupil of the lens, meaning it can open up more or less depending on how much light you want reaching the camera sensor. It controls depth of field, meaning you can choose between having a blurred background with shallow focus or sharpness throughout the whole photo. Numbers for aperture are expressed as f over blank, where small numbers represent bigger apertures. So, f over 4 is recommended for something like portrait photography, whereas f over 8 or 9 is better suited for landscape shots that require more of the background to be sharp. ISO is the last metric to the exposure triangle concept, and in basic terms, it's a setting that determines the brightness of the photo. This allows you flexibility with shutter speeds and apertures, since these settings can also affect the brightness of your image. However, the trade-off is that a high ISO will make a photo look generally noisy or grainy, which is usually not ideal. The ISO setting is essentially a last-ditch effort to brighten the image if you have a desired shutter speed and aperture set already. An ISO value of 400 to 800 is recommended, and it's rare that you should go above an ISO value of 1600. One last thing to note about the mode dial is that you will often find extra modes pertaining to fun or useful filters for simple photography. For example, the Canon camera has a creative filters mode, which can give you some fun options. However, it's recommended to take photos normally instead and apply these filters in post-processing in case you want to revert the filter later on. If you take a photo in black and white with a filter on the camera, but would like the color back on your image after you take it, it would be impossible. Whereas you can simply apply a black and white filter to any image you want on the computer after the fact. There's also a menu called special scene, which gives you automatic settings depending on the type of shot you desire which can be useful. For example, you can choose a portrait setting that gives a nice blurred background if you're taking portraits. After that, you should be ready to take photos. You can check out the menus to continue adjusting the settings to your liking if you so desire. It's recommended to format the SD card you're using before you start taking photos so that you can erase anything that's already on there unless you're using your own SD card and have files on it that you need. You can also turn off the guides on the Canon camera if you feel confident and would prefer to display information about the actual shots instead. The last thing to note is how you should take your photos. It's good to keep your arms close to your body while taking the shot to provide stability when either peeking through the viewfinder or using the live view. And that's the basics of how our cameras work. If you have any questions throughout the process, including how to use our tripods and microphones with these cameras, our staff is always happy to help out. Be sure to check out the Wood Center YouTube channel for more tutorials on how to use all of our other equipment.